Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our program tonight, Archaeology Then and Now. My name is Helen Liu, and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Um, before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A and we will answer them at the end of the program. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, Jose Villamat's passion for archaeology began when he was growing up in Cuba and continued as he pursued a master's in medieval archaeology from the University of York in the UK. While there, he conducted research on the trade between continental Europe and England in the 8th century CE through the use of cultural materials in local archaeological sites. He then gained a deep appreciation for the prehistory of the United States while working in a cultural resource management firm in Arkansas, where he conducted excavations throughout the Southeast and Midwest. During this time, he gained a deep appreciation for the prehistory of the US and Native Americans, especially the mound builders of the Southeast. Currently, Jose is pursuing a second master's in museum studies. Welcome, Jose. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, and thank you for the Cary Library to, uh, for putting this uh, together. But uh, I basically want to uh, cover some general information about archaeology. And hopefully, you will leave tonight with at least knowing one thing, that archaeology is not paleontology. So we're not going to talk about dinosaurs. I'm sorry uh, if that. Uh, make some of you uh, sad, but uh, paleontology, the words are really confusing because archaeo means uh, ancient and paleo means very old. So both words are pretty similar, but uh, paleontology studies uh, fossils and uh, living natural organisms. So plants, animals, and then archaeology uh, studies the cultural materials uh, created by people. So if you leave tonight with knowing anything at all about archaeology, it, let it be that we don't study dinosaurs, we study uh, Native Americans and mammoths and things like that. So to start, I just wanted to show you some of the things. These are all things that I've either uh, found myself or things that I've experienced uh, like I said, I worked mainly in Arkansas in the south and uh, in the southeast as well. And if you look on the top left, uh, there is a projectile point or uh, an arrowhead, sometimes they're called. Uh, this one is uh, bigger. It's like the, the size of your palm. So it's, it's too big to be an arrowhead. It would have been for a dart point. And it's from the archaic period, uh, which is about 4,000 years ago. Uh, 4,000 years old. Um, in the center, you have a pictograph or a petro uh, or a, is rock art is what we call it. But uh, basically, it's a snake. You can see it very faintly, the image of a snake. And that one is at Pettigene State Park. It's a cave there that's called Rock House. And uh, that cave was a uh, habitated was was used by humans around a thousand years ago to to 500 years ago uh, and then uh, down on the bottom left you have some head pots uh, from the Nodina phase uh, it's a culture uh, if you've heard of the Mississippian culture it's from the late Mississippian uh, period and it's from like 1400s to uh, 1600s and these are really interesting because they're thought to have been uh, the uh, uh, replicas or effigies of the heads of captured uh, warriors. So when they went to war and they captured the warriors, they would decapitate them and then they would make effigy pots of their heads. And then these pots would be buried in mounds with uh, the rulers or the warriors of, of of the uh, Nodina uh, phase, the Nodina culture. Um, 
The other two that you see here on the right are coins. And uh, you've probably seen uh, some of these coins before if you're a coin collector or if you've seen older coins. Uh, it's a mercury dime from 1917. And the other one is a shield nickel uh, from about 1800s, uh, probably late 1800s, 1850s. Um, and what I wanted to show with this slide is just uh, an idea of what an artifact is and what type of uh, cultural material archaeologists uh, study or look at. But what is archaeology? Um, archaeology is the study of the cultural material created by humans in the past. So that can cover anything from a building, from a house, uh, even if the structure is no longer uh, uh, standing, we study the post holes or the post molds of uh, the, the hole that the post uh, left when it was in, in, in the ground. So we can uh, do a diagram. We can look at what the um, building uh, looked like when it was erect. Um, we also uh, study things like uh, there's zoo archaeology, where you study the um, fossil, uh, the um, uh, bone material of like animals that were uh, hunted or uh, uh, used by humans, uh, fish, uh, deer a lot of deer, uh, even mammoth, if you're looking at a Paleo-Indian site. Um, the way we do this is by digging in the ground. Archaeologists dig in the ground, and uh, you can also do it nowadays, especially. There's a lot of really interesting uh, technology out there, like ground-penetrating radar and LIDAR. Uh, now, sometimes you don't have to dig. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that technology is very costly. So uh, basically, excavating is still the, the cheapest and the most efficient uh, method of recovery, of data recovery. Um, the people that we study is uh, people like the Native Americans uh, from the tribes that we know like the Nibmuk, the Massachusetts, uh, the Wampanoag, uh, the, Cher the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Muscogee Creek. But we also study English colonists. We study the Civil War. Uh, we even study uh, stuff from the 1930s and 40s uh, that anything that is 65 years or older is considered historically significant. So you know, that's around the corner and, and, and it's, his, it's, it's archaeologically significant. Uh, so we, we do archaeology in the woods, uh, along rivers, on highways, and uh, during major construction uh, of like infrastructure. So if there's a pipeline that's being built or a water line or a highway, these are times when you will have archaeological surveys done. Um, the reason why we do archaeology is because it can tell us what life was like in the past. It, it can shed light. Uh, if you have to think about it this way. A lot of times people didn't write down how they lived. They didn't write down, even, even in, in the time period where we have history, where we have written records, people that live their life as like peasants, for example, or people that just live their normal day-to-day -day life? Where did they buy groceries? Uh, what did they do on a Saturday night? These things are not recorded in history. So in the, in the um, records, in the um, written records. So what archeologists do is we look at the materials that are left behind. So the trash or the uh, process of making tools, any kind of material that's left behind that's what we look at. And that's what we use to answer questions about how people lived, uh, what they ate, uh, how they hunted, how they made tools, how they, uh, how they uh, uh, procured salt, how they uh, got salt from uh, salt mines or from salt marches, um, how, they, how they cooked with, uh, with ceramics or before we had ceramics with uh, steatite bowls or uh, in like, um, yeah, 
all, all sorts of things. Anything that, you know, uh, anything that, that remains, that, that leaves a, a trace behind. Because unfortunately, even in archaeology, we have a problem that if you make something out of wood or if you make something out of, uh, you know, a bone, it doesn't necessarily, if the soil is too acidic, it won't uh, survive. It won't, uh, uh, it, it gets decomposed and, and then we can't find that. So, and especially if we're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. So the way we do archeology span is through excavation mainly, like I said, and by using the scientific method, we pose a hypothesis or we have an idea of uh, something that we would like to uh, investigate. And then we use the data recovered from the excavation to look at those questions and to answer those questions. There's also nowadays a really interesting technology, ground penetrating radar, GPR, is a machine that uh, you roll over the surface of the ground and it shoots uh, radio waves uh, down into the ground and they bounce back off of uh, solid objects. So you can see things like uh, bodies that were buried. If, if you don't wanna excavate because it's a cemetery, for example, or if there's any risk of like destroying very fragile things, you can do uh, GPR. Uh, there's also LIDAR. Uh, you might have heard of this. It's when they fly a plane over the canopy of the jungle and they shoot a, a laser, a light, uh, down and the laser, because of the frequency of the light, cuts through the canopy, through the trees, and it uh, shows the the topography of the of the ground. So you can that this is how they have found some of the more recent uh, Maya and Aztec uh, temples, and you can find mounds in the United States. It, it's it's being used more and more. Uh, so it's really great. They've even used it in the desert uh, to find like pyramids and things like that. Uh, and like I said before, archaeology is not paleontology, but we already covered that. So, so very briefly, I'm just going to go over how archaeology has evolved and how we get to what we do now and how we do it now. But archaeology has been with us since the beginning of time. Um, in prehistoric times, uh, when people found an object that was interesting to them, whether it be a mineral or whether it be, uh, you know, a quartz, a quartz crystal, or whether it was a fossil, or whether it was an artifact created by a previous uh, culture, uh, people have been, uh, you know, keeping these objects and, and, and being interested about our past and where we come from, from a very early time. We have uh, records of Roman, uh, Roman writers uh, talking about how, you know, they uh, studied the, the Greek culture and the Mycenaean, the Mycenaean culture. And uh, for example, like Troy, uh, they, they study, they, they used to talk about how they, they came from, from Troy, that how they, they were created from that culture. So uh, an interesting point, uh, Romans thought that uh, stone axes were actually created when a lightning bolt hit the ground. When, when a lightning bolt hit the ground, it would create a, a stone ax. And they thought that that's how they were created. So they didn't necessarily know that they were created by humans, but they were still interested in the, in the objects. Moving on, uh, by the 1500s, 1600s, uh, you get what's called antiquarianism. Antiquarians uh, like to collect uh, rarities. They were uh, people that usually were in power or they had money or they were in the sciences. And they like to collect what are called cabinets of curiosities. And here in the picture, you see an example of a cabinet of curiosity from Natick, uh, from the uh, Natick History Museum in Natick, Massachusetts. And uh, antiquarians are the very beginning of archeology span because they and the beginning of museums too, because they 
try to answer questions about the human past by having this collection of uh, cultural materials. Uh, and they, they looked at that. Then in the 1800s, uh, the, uh, archaeology exploded and expanded because uh, 1793 is when the Louvre uh, was first opened. And then Napoleon went into Egypt. Uh, and then he brought back from Egypt all of the great examples of Egyptian culture and you know, basically looted uh, all of the cultural uh, material from, from, from Egypt. But that was one of the big stepping stones of archeology span was going to an ancient land, to, to a place that people lived back in the day and learning about that. So it happened in Mesopotamia, so Iraq nowadays. Uh, and through the 19th and 20th century, archeology span was very much a colonial endeavor and it was very much uh, an imperialist endeavor. It was basically, you go to the country that you're interested in, you dig through all of the modern layers, you dig through anything modern, anything medieval, anything uh, you know from the early uh, re uh, Renaissance period, you dig through everything and you get to the classical age and then you excavate the classical materials and you have the beautiful amphoras and you have the beautiful uh, columns and the temples and things like that. Uh, one, uh, one interesting example of this was Heinrich, Heinrich Schliemann. He was, a, <laughs> he was an interesting character, but uh, uh, Schliemann had this idea that you could find Troy. You could find the actual Troy from Homer's uh, Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, he thought that it was an actual place and he thought it was an actual place in uh, modern day Turkey and uh, in Anatolia, in the, in the coast. And he thought that by excavating down, uh, you could find uh, you know, evidence of Troy. And he found uh, the fact that what he found was that there had been many Troys and they had been uh, conquered and sacked and rebuilt one over the other over the other. Uh, another interesting turning point in uh, archeology span was 1922 uh, when the tomb of Tutankhamen uh, was discovered. Uh, Tutankhamen wasn't a great ruler or a magnificent ruler in Egypt's history, but the fact that his tomb was so well preserved and it hadn't been looted uh, in the present uh, was the reason why it was so important because he gave us a snapshot of what life was like in, in ancient Egypt and it, it had a wealth of uh, materials for us to look at. It, it showed us uh, there were boats, there were uh, coins, all, all sorts of things. I mean, uh, everything from, from very low, uh, uh, from very low in the hierarchy all the way to, to the pharaoh. There, there were uh, materials in there. So then archaeology, um, from this imperialistic and very colonial idea, and from this idea of uh, empowering or bettering your nation's uh, status and, and, and power through getting expensive you know cultural materials from other countries from that in the 50s uh we had a new uh wave of archaeology come through and that was called processualism and very briefly the theory uh processualism said that archaeology is anthropology and that you could use the scientific method and you could use science to answer questions about the past. It was a positivist view. Uh, positivist means that there are questions that we have that can be answered. Anything that we 
think as a question has an answer in the world. So uh, with that, archaeology took a turn because now it became a scientific endeavor uh, that had to be properly recorded, uh, was able to answer questions about how humans uh, lived in the past. Uh, it started looking at uh, different, uh, you know, uh, interactions between uh, uh, social strata or classes and things like that. Uh, so that was one of the very major changes of archaeology. And then in the 70s and 80s, uh, post-processualism was uh, the next big change, which basically post-processualism said that uh, our interpretations, how I interpret archaeology, like this remains, versus how you interpret these remains, they're completely subjective. I have uh, some biases because of my culture and my upbringing, and I bring those biases to archaeology, and I will think that something is an artifact or not an artifact, and I will think that something happened because of this or that, and, and you might think something completely differently. So post-processualism was able to bring subjectivity to archaeology and to bring an, an idea of questioning uh, long-held views, like, oh, uh, the Romans did this because of this, or, uh, you know, the Celts were uh, very, very, uh, the Celts were less uh, evolved or they were less, uh, you know, civilized than the Romans. But then when you went back, you actually saw that they had a, a, a wealth of culture. It's just, it was different. And they didn't build in stone the way that the Romans built in stone. So from these, from the mixing of processualism and post-processualism, these two combine, and that's where we get modern archaeology. And nowadays, uh, all around the world, um, archaeology basically is done uh, to answer questions about the past. And it's done uh, with the scientific method. Archaeology is no longer its own thing, or it's no longer under the banner of history. Archaeology is now under anthropology. So in anthropology, there's many uh, branches. And in anthropology, there is cultural anthropology, which studies uh, uh, the culture, like modern cultures uh, usually, but it also can study like uh, hunter-gatherers and um, people like that. There is physical anthropology, uh, which uh, studies the body, or it's also called biological anthropology or bioanthropology. It studies the, the anatomy of the human body and the anatomy of uh, previous, so like uh, Australopithecus, like Lucy, Lucy, and uh, you know, things like that. Uh, but then there's also, uh, there's uh, other, I won't, bore, I won't bore you with the details, but uh, archeology span is one of the branches of anthropology. And it, it, it is used as a tool to answer questions about us, about humans, about how we came to be, about how we lived in the past. But nowadays, Nowadays, 90% of all of archaeology is done by cultural resource management companies. Cultural resource management is basically a field of archaeology where any project around the world, um, obviously, I know mainly because of, uh, I know mainly how the US works, but this happens all over the world. Any project that takes federal funding or has government funding and it has to, uh, it's going to be an infrastructure project, it requires clearance. It requires uh, uh, an archaeological assessment to make sure that any, any resources or any, any uh, remains that are in the area won't be negatively impacted, won't be uh, destroyed. So, uh, for example, you, you might uh, remember uh, how King Richard was found under a parking lot. 
that that uh, story, uh, he was found under a parking lot because they were building, they were uh, taking out the parking lot and building an, a new uh, building, a, a new infrastructure. And when they were excavating, they found remains, they found uh, bones. And then you have to say, well, is it modern? Is it uh, someone who died yesterday? Or is it historic or prehistoric? Once they found out that it was historic, then they brought the archaeology team and they, uh, you know, found out that it was actually King Richard. So, but that, that was an example of rescue archaeology. And 90% and of all archaeology uh, today, you know, about 10% is done by academia. So it's like what you think about a traditional archaeological investigation with like the professor and the digging units and, and the project and the, the students going to a field school. That's about 10%, maybe 15% of archaeology. But the main bulk of it is done by CRM companies. Uh, I have uh, six years experience doing CRM in the Southeast and in the Midwest, Oklahoma, Kansas. Uh, and CRM is uh, divided into three different uh, categories or levels. Uh, sometimes it's divided into four, but that's just uh, you know background research, uh, researching the background histories and, and things like that of the region. But uh, phase one or the first level is basically going out to see if there are any archeological sites. You go out and you excavate, you dig holes in uh, 20 meter increments in, in a very regulated fashion. And basically uh, you are asking yourself, are there any archeological sites out here? And when you do find something, then you uh, create a grid and then you, uh, you excavate along that grid and you try to map out, you try to plot out um, the archeological site uh, to see how big it is, to see how large it is, to see how, uh, you know, how deep the deposits go. Once that's done, and it might be years after. Some of the archeological sites that I've revisited um, were found in the 70s and 80s. And then in 2014 or 15, you know, they were going to do some, uh, some work, some improvement in the area, or they wanted to use the area for uh, some infrastructure. And that's when you go into phase two, which is site testing. The, the objective there is to see if the archeological site is significant or not significant. Does it have enough resources? Does it have enough materials to answer questions about the human past? Is it something that we haven't seen before? Do we have a lot of other sites like that? And if we do, then uh, can we main, can we keep this one from being uh, disturbed further? Uh, usually, archaeologists will uh, will stay on the side of not disturbing the deposits and of uh, keeping sites capped because archaeology, by its very essence, is a destructive uh, science. You have to excavate and disturb the context and destroy the context of the remains to excavate the, the cultural material out. And unfortunately, what that means is that in the future, when a great new technology comes about, when the future humans of our, of our world come back to this place and try to answer questions about how people lived in the past, they won't have the context, they won't have the intact soils uh, where those materials were, were kept. And the final phase of uh, um, CRM is data recovery. So you found a site, 
you tested the site, it is significant, we want to protect it, but then there's a highway that's going to be built, or there's a water line, or a pipeline, a gas pipeline, or electrical uh, line that's going to be built. And unfortunately, the site has to be excavated. It, it, it will be destroyed. And they cannot route the pipeline around it. It has to go through it. That's when we come in and we do data recovery. And basically, that's when you get your large excavations, like your very big, you know, Indiana Jones, like, uh, you know, big two by two excavation units. Uh, so here in the, in the pictures, you can see on the top left, that's me digging in a two by two. That's, that's a large uh, excavation unit. And this was at a site where uh, it was an, an archaic site. It was a Calf Creek site. And uh, it was really interesting because um, the Calf Creek component in Arkansas is very ephemeral. It's very hard to to distinguish, there's not many sites that have a, a very concrete, very uh, good uh, source of uh, cultural material. Uh, you'll find one arrowhead, uh, one projectile point, or a couple bones. You, you'll find uh, flakes, very small things. But in this site, we did the phase two, uh, we tested it, and then they were going to build the highway. And then we had to do the phase three because it was significant enough and, and a, a really good site. And, and we had to go in and recover all of the materials so they, they weren't uh, destroyed. And there's actually uh, uh, my, my uh, the, the person in charge, I guess, uh, you call him uh, uh, the principal investigator. But uh, the principal investigator at that site actually just wrote a book about the Calf Creek component. And it's uh, really interesting stuff that, that he's talking about in there. Uh, on the bottom, the bottom two pictures, uh, that's uh, on the left, that's what you use to uh, um, shake. It's a, it's a screen or a shaker. And you use that to screen the dirt so that when the dirt falls through the mesh, you are left with the uh, pottery, with the ceramics, and you're left with the projectile points, the arrowheads, and you're left with the bone, and you're left with the glass, and you're left with the coins and with the nails, but the dirt falls through. Um, we also do uh, metal detecting, but the problem with metal detecting is that you're only finding things made out of metal. And, and a lot of times, especially if you're looking at prehistoric, you know, very, very old things, they didn't, uh, in, in North America, they, they didn't use uh, metal that much. Uh, so uh, usually what we do is we excavate uh, shovel test uh, holes. And on the bottom, on the bottom uh, two pictures, the one on the right, that's what a shovel test looks like. Uh, you basically dig a round uh, hole and you uh, do it by levels. You do it in uh, 10 centimeter uh, increments uh, or uh, most of the time you do it based on the stratigraphy. So in that picture, you can see that the soil changes from light uh, brown to darker brown towards the bottom that's a soil change. And those soil changes can guide you, can tell you not only how old things are, but also whether there's deposits or not. So very briefly, clay takes a really long time to, to create, to, to, to make. Uh, it's a sediment that, that takes a really long time, uh, pressure and uh, compaction. So when you find a clay layer, uh, that was usually created uh, very, very far in the past. And there's usually not any archeological materials, human materials in that clay. There are some cases where they can be uh, disturbed 
and some things that are newer will be in lower deposits. They'll be in like older soils. But most of the time, uh, usually once you hit clay, um, the likelihood of having cultural materials is, is, is very, very slim. So you dig out your, your hole, you dig out your, your shovel test uh, by 10 centimeter increments or by uh, soil stratigraphy. And then you put it in the screen and then you shake the screen. You shake it, shake it, shake it. All the things fall out. And then you, you're left with the artifacts that, that, that you have. The picture on the right is uh, probably the, the deepest hole I've ever uh, dug. And uh, those deposits went really deep. Like uh, it was next to a creek, next to a river. And we were finding things all the way on the wall, all the way down, all the way down. It was a really interesting dig. Uh, I really liked that day. And you can see I'm, I'm sweating. This was in the middle of the summer and uh, Arkansas summer is hot and humid. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you can see in that picture, the stratigraphy. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but see how the soil is dark and then this gets lighter and then this gets really red. This soil right here is redder. Right there, I'm getting to the clay layer. I'm, I'm getting to the bottom of the, of the clay layer, but the deposits were really deep because we had a lot of uh, sediment uh, accumulation from, from the creek that was nearby. And, and that's a thing, uh, you know, the way that sites are created, it's called uh, toponymy, uh, but the way that a site is created depends a lot on rivers and sand and soil accumulation and uh, wind patterns. And there can be sites that are very, very close to the surface, like out in the Southwest, where you just walk through the desert and the wind blows and you find the pots. It's like, oh, look, there's pottery there, there's pottery there. You find stuff right on the surface. Or they can be really deep and they can be covered by a lot of soil. So uh, here's just a couple pictures of like uh, what it's like to do archaeology. Uh, I just, there's, there's a lot of talks and there's a lot of uh, resources that you can look at that show you uh, archaeological materials, that show you artifacts, that show you, you can go to a museum. The, uh, the museums here are, are great. If you go to the, um, at the MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, they have an entire Egyptian wing. They have an entire wing on Egyptian artifacts and it's amazing. But what a lot of people don't show you is the day-to-day -day living of how archeology span is done. So here on the right is uh, my crew. Uh, we're, uh, we're working in three degree weather in the winter and it was biting cold. It was very, very cold. And everybody else quit. Everybody else went home, but we stayed and, and we actually excavated uh, the water line that we were working on. And then in the middle, you can see uh, that's like a 1950s car. Like, I don't know, I don't know cars, but it's like a Chevy or a, it's, it's one of those like 50s cars and it's in the middle of the woods, but technically that is archeology. span That we, we, uh, we recorded that we found that because it's over 65 years old at the, at the time. And, uh, you know, uh, might not be significant, but if you excavate, uh, there might be other stuff there, you know, uh, you don't know. On the left, uh, you can see uh, that's Brandon. He's digging a shovel test. And we, uh, when we do water lines, uh, it's in the easement in the, uh, so the city has a 10 or 15 foot easement into your property line because they need to put in uh, the fiber optic cables and they need to put in the water lines for the houses. So here we are in someone's property in, in a landowner's uh, 
you know, property and we're digging holes and the, the donkeys came to visit us. They, they came to say hi. But we make sure to like cover all the holes back up and, and stamp them down. So obviously you don't want them to break a leg or anything. And then on the bottom, uh, it's something that we call the Archaeolympics. Uh, it's like the Olympics for archaeology. We're uh, right there, we're uh, throwing uh, darts with atolatls, with spear throwers. But what I wanted to show with that is that there's a component of archaeology that's called experimental archaeology. And that's when in the modern days, we use the same technology and the same techniques that they used in the past. And we do experiments to see how people hunted, how they lived. There's, there's amazing uh, groups of people that have built uh, entire houses. Uh, you know, I know of like the, the Choctaw and the, um, uh, oh man, the name escapes me now. But uh, yeah, there's, there's some uh, houses that uh, they've built in the way that, that they were built back in those days. And uh, locally, if you go to Plymouth, uh, the Plymouth Potosic Plantation, there you will see a, a reconstructed uh, winter house of, of the local, uh, uh, I think it's, don't, don't quote me on the, I think it's Nibmuk, but don't quote me on that. Um, but it's the Potosic, it's the, the local uh, uh, Native Americans that lived in, uh, in Plymouth. Uh, so yeah, archeology span also happens in the lab. Uh, once you excavate all that stuff, uh, what do you do? You have to sort it, you have to look through it, you have to uh, do tests and analysis on it. Uh, on the right, uh, these are samples, these are charcoal samples that we're going to do uh, carbon-14 dating on. Um, carbon-14 uh, is basically, very briefly, you've probably heard of it, but it's an isotope that is not stable. It's, a, it's an isotope of carbon-12. So when you, when you eat, when you breathe, anything that you put into your body, it's, it's made of car we're made of carbon. And it's usually carbon-12, but there's also a component that's carbon-14. And carbon-14, uh, it has a half-life. It deteriorates over time. Your body can't replace it by eating, your body can't replace it. So the less carbon-14 something has, the older, the, the longer it's been in the ground. So that we, we use that as a, as a absolute dating uh, te technique. So we use that to find the date of, of something. And then uh, based on that, we can get relative dates. So if in this layer of soil is uh, 1,000 years old, and we find this artifact, if we find that same artifact in another soil, it, mi it might be, you know, it usually is a thousand years old. It's from the same time period. So that's when we can use relative dating versus absolute dating. We also do a lot of other tests. Archaeology is really cool, and they do a lot of really interesting stuff in the lab. Uh, they do lipid analysis where they can find what kind of foods were cooked in a pot based on the, on the residue that was left on the pot. They also find what kind of animals uh, were hunted based on the kind of fat cells that the animals had. Uh, they do blood residue analysis to, to, on the projectile points to see if there's any uh, uh, animal blood residue. And then you can tell if it was a mammoth or if it was a deer or bear. Uh, so archaeology is not only out in the field, but it's also in the lab. And I personally, I've worked in, a, in an archaeological lab uh, through those six years that I worked in CRM. I, I sorted artifacts and washed uh, artifacts and prepared them for curation, for uh, storage. And yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, over here, uh, the top left picture that you see there, those are volunteers 
at uh, the Toltec Mounds Archaeological State Park. And uh, it's an interesting park because it's part of the Plum Bayou uh, mound building uh, culture. There were mound builders in the woodland period. Uh, we have different time periods for like when things uh, happen, but the woodland time period is from like 1,000, it's like uh, 3,000 years ago to about, um, yeah, to about uh, 2,000 years ago. So something, something like that. It's like 1,000 BCE to like zero. But, uh, but you can see there, those are volunteers that are sorting to artifacts and they are looking at the cultural materials that were excavated in previous uh, seasons. Here in Massachusetts, you can uh, volunteer. I'll, I'll talk about that later, but there are many options that you have for volunteering and learning more about archaeology if you're interested. One of the main questions that we ask in archaeology is how old is it? Like, when is it from? And like I said before, you can use stratigraphy. Uh, basically, the deeper something is in the, in the dirt, in the soil, the deeper something is, the older it is. And in that picture there on the top, you can see there's a very defined layer that's black. That's a burn layer. The forest, there was a forest fire and the forest burned. And then, you know, more soil was deposited on top of that. So that's a, that's a way that we can tell time. It's, it's relative time, but anything below that layer is from a time period and anything after that layer is from a different time period. Um, the other ways that we can tell uh, how old something is is, by, is through context, uh, different artifacts that are together. If you know the date for this thing and this other thing is next to it, then they must be from a relatively similar uh, time period. That's why it's super important never to take something out of context. It's, it's important that you don't excavate or pick up an artifact and take it away because that prevents archaeologists from learning, from, from knowing, uh, you know, how old something was or like what humans were doing in that. It destroys the context. Um, but I have an example here, and you guys can do this. If you are antiquers, if you like antiques, or if you uh, like old bottles or anything like that, there's a website that's the uh, Society for Historical Archaeology uh, and the SHA.org, uh, and you go there, and they have the maker's marks. Um, so this bottle that I have here has a diamond and an eye inside of the diamond. And by looking at the chart, at the, at the different maker's marks in, that have been used over time, we can tell that that's made by the Illinois Glass Company between 1915 and 1929, which gets really good because if you, <laughs> I know that's a lot of years, but when you're talking archaeological, uh, you know, dates, we're talking thousands and thousands of years. So getting into that time period is you know, just that very small frame is really great. And then on top of that, if you look at the bottle, the bottle doesn't have a label on it. It has uh, embossed writing. So that also tells you how old it is. It's before uh, printed labels were used on bottles. And then even more, uh, you can read that it's Dr. King's new discovery for coughs and colds. And you, can t and you can research, this is when background research helps. You can tell that that company was created in the 18, uh, 1879 is when the company was created. So it can be no older than 1879, but you have the Illinois Glass Company logo on it. So it was probably from the 1915, 1917, something like that. So that's, that's some of the ways that archeology span uh, say how old something is. And again, just to, just to remind everyone, uh, take lots of pictures, take all the pictures you want and uh, post it, uh, you know, it's great, it's fine. 
but try not to pick up artifacts. Try not to take them out of the context because once you do, uh, the information of how they're related to other things in that site gets lost. So now I'm going to focus a little bit more on, I guess, what you can do if you're interested like me in archeology. span And if you uh, want to uh, pursue a career in archeology, span obviously you can look at academia. Uh, that's the more traditional, you can teach, you can uh, research, you can excavate uh, in the summers, uh, do field schools, uh, you can go to Africa and look at uh, fossils from, uh, you know, Homo erectus, Australopithecus, uh, great stuff in academia. You can work for state parks, you can work for the Forest Service, uh, you can work for uh, the highway department. Every department uh, usually has a head archaeologist. Uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, for example, the, um, the state parks uh, have an archaeologist. And then also uh, the, um, what is it called? I forget. You'll have to remind me of the name, but the, the DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, uh, has a head archaeologist. So that's a job. And they hire assistant archaeologists that help uh, with that uh, position. So that's also a place where you might find employment. Uh, um, there's also uh, employment with the government and with the military. Um, they do a lot of uh, uh, work. Uh, for example, I worked at a military base, uh, Camp Robinson in Arkansas. Anytime that they want to use uh, land in the military base for uh, maneuvers or for construction, they have to do an archeological survey. So that might be a place where, where you can find employment as well. Uh, the the TPOs, uh, the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. Uh, so each tribe has uh, an officer that uh, is involved in NAGPRA, in uh, the uh, Native American Graves Repatriation Act. Uh, so um, there's a there's an officer that deals with archaeology. Uh, the tribes also hire out a lot of archaeologists to do work for them uh, if, they're, if they require expertise that they might not have. And like I said before, there's cultural resource management. Uh, here in Massachusetts, I know three different uh, companies that do archaeological uh, surveys. So obviously, uh, there's some really good websites, archaeology fieldwork or archaeological fieldwork. Uh, it's a good website. And then Shovel Bums on Facebook. Shovel Bums is a great uh, website, or sorry, a uh, Facebook group to find archaeological work. And if you're interested in pursuing it as a career, I would first recommend going to college and uh, majoring in anthropology uh, and then going from there. That's definitely where you want. But even if you don't want to pursue it as a career, or if you're not sure if you would like to pursue it as a career or not, uh, you might be interested in it and you might want to get involved. And uh, the way to get involved is through your local uh, archaeological societies. Massachusetts has a great archaeological society. Uh, and I am part of the um, North. Uh, I guess, I, I forget what the name of it, uh, but it's, it's the, the North Shore, is the Northern Massachusetts uh, chapter of the uh, Archaeological Society. But there's one in the South as well. I think there's three. There's one in the South and there's one in the West. Uh, and then um, October is Massachusetts Archaeology Month. That's when we celebrate archaeology throughout Massachusetts. And there's uh, a couple different, if you want to take this, uh, this websites, uh, I can put them in the chat as well, but uh, just Google uh, 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 October Archaeology Month uh, or Google Dirt Detectives. Uh, these are all taken from the Mass, uh, Massachusetts Archaeological Society site. 
but uh, they have Adelado days where they throw spears with the spear throwers with Adelado. And they, uh, you know, you get to, uh, ex you know, experiment and you get to uh, try how that would, how Native Americans used to hunt back in the day. Uh, there's digging for history in Danvers. Uh, there's uh, maritime archaeology and heritage at Salem Wharf. And again, I know these are all uh, from the North Shore because that's before I moved, uh, I was living in Gloucester. So I had a lot of uh, information about what's going on in the North Shore. But uh, I'm, I'm sure if you Google it, if you look up archaeology, Massachusetts, you can find your local, uh, your local um, resources that, that will have some events going on. Uh, museums are a great place uh, as well. Uh, right now, I'm working on getting a degree in museum studies. And there's a lot of overlap between archaeology and museums because museums uh, conserve and preserve the artifacts that we dig up. So um, there's a lot of work that can be done in museums as well. And uh, if you look at your local museum, if are uh, your local historical society, they they will also have uh, you know many events. I know, for example, Natick Historical Society and then uh, Framingham, um, the Framingham uh, History Center, uh, the Historical Society, uh, they have a lot of events and a lot of really cool artifacts that if you want to come in and look at them, you can, uh, you can explore uh, yourself. You can, you can look and be like, wow, this is what it looked like. This is what people cooked with and what people hunted with and what people uh you know uh, uh did agriculture with uh the the axes and the hoes and all the stuff that they used so yeah if you're interested in archaeology get this is the very bare minimum there's tons out there but if you want to get involved definitely uh look at those look at those resources and and you can they can guide you uh, in the right direction. And, and yeah, archaeology is for everyone. So, um, you know, especially now in the modern day, um, history sometimes is a little elitist, like historians, not so much now. I mean, but history used to be looked at as, you know, we won the war, so we tell the story or something like that. But uh, archaeology gives a voice to the voiceless. Um, you know, people that didn't record their history, people that were defeated, battlefield archaeology, you can still uh, give those people a voice uh, by doing archaeological, uh, you know, surveys, uh, research. And yeah, that's, that's what I have for you. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I didn't bore you too much, but uh, I can talk about this all day. I could go on for hours, but uh, I, I think archaeology is amazing and it's a very interesting uh, topic. So hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Jose. It was so interesting and I love your passion for archaeology. We do have some questions. And so for those of you who would like to stay on and um, just um, hear all the answers to his questions, um, and for those who um, need to go, thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, Terry had a question that kind of um, talks about the volunteer activities that you talked about. And she just wants to know what uh, type of requirements do you need to have? Usually uh, very few. That, um, if you go to the, to the websites, they'll tell you uh, specifically what they, what they require, but very few. Uh, I have seen when I've volunteered, because I also volunteered, uh, when I've volunteered, I've seen anything from, you know, five-year-olds all the way to 80-year-olds. I mean, obviously, archaeology is done on your knees, and archaeology is, you know, excavation can be rigorous. So, you know, you, you have to lift, uh, you know, buckets of dirt, and you have to, like, uh, 
uh, shake the shaker, uh, but there's always, even if it's taking notes, even if it's taking pictures, even if it's just helping with uh, just sorting artifacts, there's tons, tons. Uh, archaeology is very, very, uh, very good about being uh, for everyone. Being, being uh, there, there's very few requirements. Um, I mean, there's not even to volunteer. There's not even a requirement of having to have like a degree or like a bachelor's or anything like that. They they want to teach you. They want you to learn uh, the process and and see if you like it. See if you like doing archaeology. Thank you. Uh, Fabrizio says, thank you, Jose. Very interesting. What are clues that tell you there could be artifacts or a sediment in a terrain? Yeah, that's that's a great question. That's a really good question. So usually when you're an archaeologist, you're like a detective and you're like a hunter. You're like, uh, you know, people say like you can smell when there's a when there's a site, uh, but uh, you're, you'll be walking out in the woods. And all of a sudden, there's a lot of overgrowth. There's a lot of briars and, and, and green briars and, and thorns and blackberry bushes. Anytime there's a lot of stuff like that, any uh, like uh, vegetation like that, that means that that soil has been disturbed uh, at some point and there could be deposits there. Usually a lot of times when you find uh, structures or mounds or uh, you know uh, stone foundations for houses, they'll be covered in briars. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times, if you find this is for historic sites, but if you find things that don't fit uh, the vegetation, so you'll find John quills, or you'll find irises, you'll find uh, lilies, you'll find vegetation in the middle of the woods. You'll be walking in oak woods old growth, you know, oaks and pines. And then all of a sudden you'll find like a really old tree, like, you know, 75, 100 year old tree that's like three people around. You'll find a tree like that and you're like, okay, that's been there for a while. And then you'll find, you know, like this like iris is growing and it's like, all right, that that's not native to North America. That's planted, that was brought by European settlers. And you'll find yucca, which is not the root yucca that uh, Latino uh, communities eat. It's the yucca plant, which is a de decorative uh, plant that's also used for weaving baskets. These yucca plants and these irises, they're non-native vegetation. So that's the first thing that tells you there's a site. If you don't have vegetation and you're going out into a pasture in like a field, uh, the contour, if there's any mounds, any like elevations, that'll tell you that there's something there, there was something there at, uh, in the past. And then finally, if you find on the surface, what we call surface finds, uh, you'll find uh, pieces of pottery or glass. I'm an archeologist. Even to this day, I walk around looking at my feet, looking at the ground. I, 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 wa I walk around looking, you know, like my, my wife tells me, like, you're always finding pennies and nickels and, and dimes. And it's like, that's because I'm looking, you know. But uh, you look at the ground and, and you'll find, you know, uh, pieces of glass. And if it's purple, purple glass, like amethyst glass, that's really old. That's like, it's been solarized. They used magnesium back in the day to make glass clear because it was very hard to make clear glass. And this like purplish glass, it's pretty old. It's from like the 1800s, uh, 1700s. I think it's 1800s. But uh, so that, that, those are some of the, the ways that we can tell um, how things, you know, uh, how there's a site. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anna says, fantastic talk, Jose. Thanks so much for the shout out for the Framingham History Center. Um, Amelda wants to know, what's the most interesting item you have found? Yeah, well, so maybe interesting for me. <laughs> uh, I don't know that it would be very interesting for people, but uh, there was this uh, project that we, we were working on and we were looking at 
houses that were given to uh, Civil War uh, veterans, uh, Civil War, I guess, like uh, people that fought in the Civil War, they settled in, in this area. And out of the, out of the back porch, we, we found this like uh, the foundation stones for a, for a house and we found a well. And then in the back porch, what would have been the back porch of the house, I was digging and I found uh, a lead uh, bullet uh, munition, a lead, a lead uh, uh, you know, a, a ball like about that big. And uh, it was, it was, you know, from 18, 1860s, 1865. But I just thought it was the coolest thing that I, I was holding this bullet from near, you know, during the Civil War or right after the Civil War that was dropped by someone. It wasn't deformed. It wasn't, it didn't strike anything. So it wasn't shot. Somebody, I could imagine in my head, somebody sitting out the back porch or like coming through this area and like they were going to shoot something and they dropped, they dropped the, the bullet as they were like loading their, their gun. And, and then, you know, years later I come around and I find that it's just wild to me. But yeah, I, I would say that that's the coolest thing. That, that is pretty cool. Um, Terry asked, did you say that some sites you leave intact? Do you cover them? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, so if they are not going to be disturbed, then we don't we don't touch them. We don't we don't we don't mess with them. We just leave them the way they are. And the records for archaeological sites are very well guarded by the state agencies, and they're not obviously open to just anybody to to know about because people would go out and, and loot the sites, you know, steal the the archaeological materials. So people, most people don't know, there might be archaeological sites next to your house and you might not know that it's a site just because we usually don't, don't let that information out. But uh, when they are going to be disturbed, uh, like if there's going to be construction, a lot of times we'll ask that there's a bridge, if it's a highway, that they build a bridge over it. Uh, a lot of times uh, they, we will cap them so we will put soil on top of, of the site and then we'll put the, the highway, the road on top of the site. This is interesting. Uh, going back to paleontology, uh, if you haven't heard, here in Massachusetts, there is a very neat little area called Dinosaur Tracks. And I forget where it is. It's, it's over by... Uh, it's over uh, by... Uh, I forget, but uh, just look it up, Google Dinosaur Tracks, Massachusetts. And you can go to it today. You can go to it this day. You can look at Dinosaur Tracks. Uh, they're on the stone, on the, on the ground. But basically what they did is they were cutting the stone to build the highway and then they found, they found the tracks. So they, they built the highway but they left the tracks so that people can can visit it and can can look at them and stuff like that. That's fantastic. I've always wanted to go to dinosaur tracks, and I, I also forget where it is, but I'm gonna look it up. Um, Michelle, what kind of gear helps you work in winter? What are the precautions you need to take when you are in the fields? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, so I I worked at REI, uh, so basically. If you go there and you ask them, you know, outfit me, give me the kit, give me the gear, they'll 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 help you out. But uh, usually, it's it has to be a mix of stuff that will keep you warm and will keep you alive, but also rugged stuff because you're dealing with briars, you're dealing with wires, you're dealing with like the the um, screen, the mesh in the screen can cut your hands. Uh, so you definitely need like uh, thick gloves, but, but, you don't, but you don't want the gloves to be too thick because then you can't feel, you can't feel uh, for the artifacts. Because with archeology, span you see artifacts, you touch them, and then sometimes even taste them. <laughs> 
Uh, but uh, that's another story. But uh, yeah, so definitely uh, a toque or a winter hat, definitely uh, uh, insulating layer inside, and then an outer layer that's more rugged. Uh, I usually use like Carhartt or something like that, Schmidt, something that's uh, a little bit more rugged so that it doesn't get cut up. And then pants, you know, uh, you usually wear like uh, long johns, like uh, long underwear. And then you use again, like field pants, like you can use anything like cool pants or you can use like uh, prana or you can use like, you know, I, I wouldn't go with anything like too thick because uh, you have a lot of gear that you have to carry and you get hot and you get tired really quick. Thank you. Um, so Dave actually put in the name. It's called uh, Dinosaur Footprints in Holyoke Mask. Thank you, Dave. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Thank we have time for just one last question. Um, why do you not go ahead and excavate them? I guess the sites that you left intact. What is the reason for leaving the site? Yeah, I covered, I, I, I touched on that a little bit, but um, archaeology is destructive. When once you dig something out, you can never dig it out again. Like once it's out of the ground, that's it. You have individual artifacts, individual objects, but you don't know, other than the very good notes that you took, you don't have any idea of how that object was related to another object in the ground, where someone, like imagine that someone was buried. Imagine that someone was buried with like a sword and a crown and gold uh, coins, um, that stuff in the ground is intact. You can see it and it's like, oh, this person was some sort of king and, um, or queen, and they were buried uh, in the ground with their uh, wealth uh, for the future, for, for the afterlife. But if that's taken out of the ground, you know, you don't have the, the, the ability to, to look at that again. So, so usually we try not to excavate. Uh, if it's a site that we, that we think it's significant, like usually, usually it goes uh, survey and then it goes site testing. Once you test the site and you deem it that it is significant, that it's important to preserve it, then we usually leave it uh, for future generations. Um, um, our idea is that in the future, there will be better technology, better research, better note taking. I mean, even nowadays, like when, like I started out using paper notes and like writing down stuff on paper. And this was 2013. And by the end, by 2018, I was using my phone with a, with a PDF, fillable PDF. And I was like, typing in all of the information in my phone, all the notes and all the data. And for like drawing maps and everything, you, you can use an iPad and everything. So yeah, the technology that we will have in the future will greatly out, outdo anything that we have now. So that's why we do it. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, Jose. Um, and thank you for being such a great sport about staying and um, answering all of our questions. Um, and I'll be sending out a recap um, this week. And so I'll include some of these um, sites that Jose has suggested. Um, thank you all for coming this evening and have a great night.